It was nearly half past six on a bitterly cold evening when Her Majesty and Prince Philip alighted from the Viscount airliner that flew them home from France. The Minister of Transport and Civil Aviation, the airport commandant and the chairman of BEA, Lord Douglas, officially and informally welcomed them home. Temperature apart, it was no occasion for loitering. The Queen and Duke were anxious to be with their children, who were waiting to greet their parents at Windsor Castle. As they drove there, their minds must have been full indeed of Paris memories. There was the morning when they drove across the Place de la Concorde on the way to the Hôtel de Ville to meet the Mayor and Paris Council and members of that body foremost in European culture, the French Academy. At the Hôtel de Ville, the town hall of Paris, the city traditionally entertains visitors of distinction. Not since the Queen's parents were there before the war had the city's hospitality been so lavish. An address of welcome was movingly delivered by the mayor, Monsieur Rouet. By this time, all sections of the people were captivated by the Queen's charm. In her very crowded program, engagements widely varied. And with her husband's unobtrusive support, she fulfilled them all perfectly. A little boy and girl, chosen because they were born on the same days as Prince Charles and Princess Anne, presented a bouquet. The municipality gave presents for Her Majesty's children. A model of a section of the metro, the Paris Underground, which the Queen said was a bit complicated for Prince Charles, but would delight his father. As well as some very good coaches, it includes the two stations, named after George V and Hôtel de Ville. There was something for Princess Anne in that beautiful box. It turned out to be a pretty set of 12 dolls, each typical of a district of Paris. Chamber of Commerce, Her Majesty had a delightful surprise. She was presented with a replica of the watch which President Lebrun gave to her parents to give her in 1938 and which Her Majesty lost some time ago. The great works of Renault Motors showed the Queen something of up-to-date industrial France. Indeed, this factory claims to be the most advanced in automation in Europe, perhaps the world. With machines doing so much and men so little, it's a mystery that cars aren't a lot cheaper. A light blue dauphin was presented to the Queen. It had been assembled at Acton, London, and ten workers from the English factory were now present. The great Renault plant here employs 5,500 and makes 750 cars per day. At Versailles, the atmosphere changed to France of the 17th century. The great palace of Louis XIV remains the pride of a nation always conscious of its glorious past. Among those here escorting the Queen was the Secretary of State for Arts and Letters. Versailles was looted during the French Revolution and long neglected. Parts were in danger of falling down when the post-war government began restoration. Slowly it may regain its full glory, and already it is a storehouse of treasure rich beyond price. To absorb it all delights the connoisseur. Merely to be at Versailles stimulates the historical imagination. Few minds on this splendid morning dwelt on the past, nor even on tragic Marie Antoinette. The Queen was taking luncheon in the historic Hall of Mirrors in company with 300 of the most distinguished people of France. Many remembered that in this historic hall, the envoys of defeated Germany signed the Treaty of Versailles after the First World War. So early in the year, the vast grounds can never have looked more beautiful. Nature and the arts of man combined in invitation to linger. But the royal program dictated otherwise, and the Queen and Duke had to bid farewell to the splendors of Versailles. That evening, in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower, Her Majesty embarked on the presidential launch for her memorable voyage along the Seine. Splendid as were several of the gowns she wore in France, none exceeded the beauty of this one. It was a close-fitting creation of lace-covered silver tissue, gloriously embroidered in diamonds and crystal. Fully a million people had lined the banks of the river to see the Queen pass. Along the stream and back, the launch covered two miles, the central feature of the unforgettable pageant. 
They passed many living tableaux depicting the history of Paris, prominently among them, Napoleonic soldiers of the First Empire. Lighting, the Cathedral of Notre Dame shone with a new beauty. They're waiting the passage of the Queen, where the 200 white-robed boys of the Little Singers. They sang on the Ile de la Cité, on which stands the great cathedral itself. Further along, on the Ile Saint-Louis, the tableau depicted the gaiety always characteristic of the people of Paris. At the end of the island, the spectacle touched height such as no living Parisian had seen before. Flood lighting, fireworks and water jets from the fire floats combining with breathtaking effect. This pageant on the Seine was the outstanding spectacle of the Queen's visit. Her Majesty's four days in France were crowded with events almost equally enthralling. Paris and all France are left with the enduring vision of the radiant young woman who so worthily adorns the throne.